Here we are, continuing our overview, episode 1, chapters 4 through 7. Remember, we're following a particular literary structure of the book, based on the pattern of the Greek tragedy. We looked at the prologue, introduction, the paradox, where the main characters are introduced. And now we get into the first episode, which begins to present the drama of that which is to come. And this will cover approximately three years of some futurist perspective. Now, I have some learning objectives for this morning. First of all, I hope that we'll be able to distinguish seven prophetic visions. Each vision starts with the phrase, and I saw and then try to locate their fulfillment sometime before a future expression of the wrath of God or the wrath of the Lamb of God. Understand the meaning of the phrase, the Great Tribulation. Moise went through and counted up all of the allusions to the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, in this book of Revelation, and found that there were, well, hundreds. From the Pentateuch, the Psalms, Isaiah being the most frequently book cited, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and the Minor Prophets. Uh, there are so many of them, we won't have time to stop and talk about them all. But most of the strange sounding language will be found in the Hebrew Bible or in the Greek version called the Septuagint. Since this is a New Testament book, Consider for a moment the context of the New Testament. Where in human history did the New Testament come into being? And what was going on linguistically, socially, politically, economically at the time that would help us to explain what the book of Revelation was talking about? Or what kind of dif human difficulties was it replying to? And by this we mean the Gospels, the Epistles, the Apocalypse, which means Book of Revelation, are best interpreted in their own context, namely Second Temple Jewish texts. And by Second Temple, we mean those centuries from the time of Nehemiah and Ezra, when the Second Temple was built. Until when? 70? About 70 AD, that's right. 500 year period, Jewish writers were quite prolific. They produced many writings, and some of which exist to this day. So Michael told me this morning that he's just completed reading the Book of Jubilees, which has a lot of biblical expressions in it, languages and allusions, some of which are found in the New Testament. So when I say this is the most likely context, we mean not from later contexts by which the Bible is often interpreted. So, for example, the church fathers. Well, that is to say, church leaders, mostly Christians, from the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th centuries, and they had a lot to say. They were trying to define the Trinity. Actually, the Christians first came up with the doctrine of biunity that God is Father and Son. But after a few decades, they thought, well, wait, the Holy Spirit also sounds like God. And so they modified the doctrine to make the Trinity. But remember, most of them read neither Hebrew nor Aramaic. And so they were not commenting on the Jewish context of the New Testament. They worked only in the Latin language. That is to say, they, they couldn't read Greek or as the great Augustine said, I can read Greek, but I don't like it. So he worked from a Latin translation of the Bible and gave us some doctrines, one of which was expressed this morning, that is rather questionable. So for example, in Romans 5.12, the Latin Bible says, sin passed into the whole race through one man. But if you read the Bible in Greek, it doesn't say that. It says, death passed to the whole race through one man. So the doctrine of original sin came out of a grammatical mistake Augustine made using the Latin Bible. Then 
We do not accept either Roman Catholicism or Orthodoxy, the Eastern Church, traditions that define the meaning of the New Testament for us. Nor Calvinist, Armenian, Lutheran, Pentecostalist, or Dispensationalist theologies. Rather, those are theological systems that come out of Greek philosophy, were Christianized and then taught in Protestant churches down to the centuries. A dispensationalism, what's that? That's a, that's a th theology that began to develop just over a hundred years ago that divides the Bible up into seven distinct periods of history, inserted into their scheme something called a seven-year tribulation. I've never found it in the Bible myself, but that's what they teach. Or do we let the religions dictate the meaning of the Bible for us? Definitely not Islam, certainly not Mormonism, nor Jehovism. Oh, and then there's destructive or reconstructivist scholarship. There are the men and women who devote themselves to the study of the Bible and they teach in universities. They don't believe a word of it, but they're masters of the content of the Bible. But then they lay the Bible over a scheme of history that makes the Bible wrong whenever it talks about anything historical. And since the Bible is wrong about what it affirms historically, we cannot believe it for what it says doctrinally either. Or we don't have to. After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne, and he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass, like crystal. Right. So this is a book, then, that brings us into the heavenly realm. Let's consider this. One day, you yourself, a follower of Jesus Christ, you're going to enter into that throne, and you're going to meet the one seated on the throne, and interact with all the others who are up there, whom we shall look at momentarily. In any event, this is a predictive prophecy for what was to take place after what, after the message is sent to the churches. And, uh, yes, come up here, I will show you what must take place after this. Some ask, well, what is this? Well, I, I take it to be the first three chapters of Revelation. Uh, the way we're understanding the book is that each of the five episodes begins with a vision of heaven. Then it moves down to events taking place on earth, all of which lead back to praise expressed towards God. And so we'll find that all five of the episodes do exactly that. So episode one <clears throat> seems to begin from the second century, or into the first century of the common era, and will continue until a future time that's called, or in chapter 6, the wrath of the Lamb. It consists, this passage consists of seven visions, each of which is introduced by a phrase such as, then I saw, or I looked and I saw. This begins then with the throne room in heaven. All right, who are the beings in the throne room? What kinds of living creatures are there and creators? that you remember from reading the text? 24 elders. Oh, good. All right. There's the one on the throne, the 24 elders. Who else? The four 
four, the four creatures. Four living creatures or beings, yeah. There's more. The lamb. The lamb will be there. <laughs> Myriad of angels. Myriads of angels. Let's see if we got them all. God on his throne, the lamb. Oh, the four guardians you mentioned. The, and the seven spirits that go out from God into the world. And once they get out into the world, they're called the seven angels. I will try to identify some of these in a moment. There's also a lot of furniture. Do you remember what those were? Thrones. Thrones. Okay, yeah. Um, thrones. Thrones. Mm -hmm. There's something called the sea of glass. Remember, in antiquity, glass was rather a marvelous invention. And anything made of glass is something that people would stare at and look at and handle and you know, and watch the light shine through it. It was amazing. Uh, and then the, the altar of incense, an altar of sacrifice, the Ark of the Covenant is there, even harps for worship. What does this sound like to you from elsewhere in the Bible? Tabernacle. The tabernacle out in the wilderness, which eventually was brought into the temple. And so this is a place for what? for worship and for meeting with the living God. All right, someone read for us. Around the throne and on each side of the throne are four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. Right, where in the Hebrew Bible do you also encounter four such creatures? Daniel. Good, that's close. Daniel and another biblical prophet lived at about the same time, and both of them wrote in Babylon. So that was Ezekiel. So if you go to Ezekiel chapter 1, you will find four, four such creatures. Well, notice the eyeballs here. Uh, because the Bible seems to say it, uh, the yeah, Christian art puts eyeballs all over everything. Although the same word that is used for the eye, other places is used for a reflection or a shining light, a sparkle coming off something. And so this text in the Hebrew is probably saying these things were reflecting light. Every time they moved, it was like those spheres we used to have in dance halls where the light would hit it and shine all over the place. What were you doing there? <laughs> uh, in Ezekiel, those four living creatures, they were carrying something. Remember what it was? <coughs> the throne. And the throne had wheels on it. And the throne would move around on earth in all four coordinates of the zodiac, of the compass. And meaning, there was a throne that was ruling over every place. But then Ezekiel said, above the throne, or on the throne, there was something else. What was that? What was the glory of Yahweh? So these four living creatures, they are what other places may be referred to as seraphim or cherubim. That is, throne guardians that are known from the surrounding religions as well. The Bible borrowed, actually, Babylonian and Assyrian words for these, uh, these creatures, cherubs and seraphs. So you see pictures here, Neo-Assyrian wheeled throne that could be pulled by creatures, a throne chariot, a big chair that some guys that sit on. And at about the same period of time in Greece, here's a, the uh, Persian period Greek god Tritolemus, seated on a wheeled throne that has wings. The imagery here then is not to be mistaken. The four living creatures signal to us that we're dealing with the throne of Yahweh, the living God. Well, let's go ahead and read this somewhere. Four living creatures, I saw a wheel on the earth beside the living creatures, one for each of the four of them. Over the heads of the living creatures, shining like awe-inspiring crystal, 
the likeness of a throne with a human appearance. All right. So just as there was Yahweh was appearing to Ezekiel in some kind of human form, that throne that was flying around the world, so we are to understand from the book of Revelation, we're dealing with the same deity who happens to be able to appear in a human form. Where else in the Old Testament does Yahweh appear in a human form? The angel of God. The angel of the Lord. And in Daniel, when in a vision, he saw this being, like a human being, a son of man, that came into the throne room of heaven and was given dominion over the entire earth. If that were not enough, a coin was found a few years ago, Gaza, which in antiquity was southern Philistia, depicting a winged chariot and a deity sitting on it. And the inscription, three Hebrew characters, yod a Vav, from the name Yahu, possibly a king at that time, or if that last character is Adalaf, then it's Yehuda or Judea. So this is a this is an imagery that was well known in the ancient Near East. So in this first vision, we learn that everything that happens on earth starts in heaven. So Revelation 4, 1 through 6. There's a trumpet, a voice like a trumpet that speaks. Where is there also a trumpet-like voice in the Hebrew Bible? Oh, sorry, there it is. <laughs> Moses at Mount Horeb. And then in verses 6 through 8, we have the four living creatures, the throne guardians, which we've already looked at. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind, the first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And they are singing, and they sing three sets of three. Can you recall what those are? That's the first one, three times holy. Then, who was and is and is to come. All right, so the eternity was, is, and is to come. And then the third line, Lord God Almighty. Lord for Yahweh in Hebrew. God for Elohim, and Almighty for El Shaddai. The three major uh, names or titles for the one God. This idea of God being existing in trinities is not particularly new. All right, in verse 9, following, you have the 24 elders, amongst other beings mentioned. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks, to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne, and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. This has always been a puzzle. Who are the 24 elders, or whom do they represent? Or are they actually themselves? Well, you've probably seen a lot of theories over the years. <coughs> Maybe your Bible even has a note. So some have said, especially Jewish readers, <coughs> oh, those elders, those represent the 24 books of the Tanakh, a Hebrew abbreviation for Torah, prophets and the writings. It's the Bible that reveals God to us. And so 24 elders, that must be a symbol for the Bible. It's possible, but I don't think anybody has ever proved it. Secondly, 
Here's what Christians often suggest. Oh, well, that, that, that represents the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles of Jesus. Add up, 12 plus 12 is 24. We've got it. We nailed it. Well, and that could be the tw that 24 could also be the divine council that's, that's remained. Okay, let's, we're going to get that in point four. Others have said, well, maybe this is the 24 orders of priests. So if you look them up in Jeremiah and 1 Chronicles, there are actually 24 clans of Levites who shared in the uh, service of the temple or the tabernacle. And then fourthly, others say, well, perhaps these are the non-fallen gods who were put in charge of the 70 nations back in Genesis after the Tower of Babel incident. God uh, dispersed the nations, and they, actually a list of 70 is given, or 72 if you divide up the names a little differently. Reason for which in the New Testament, the manuscripts vary. How many did Jesus send out? Was it 70, or did he send out 72? Well, those who were transcribing the Bible <laughs> were following either one tradition or the other. I don't know which one's correct myself. But in any event, the idea here is, according to Psalm 82 and many passages of the New Testament, those angelic, angelic beings who were put in charge of the nations became gods for those nations and were worshipped as gods. In Psalm 82, it says, God has taken his stand in the assembly of the gods, and he begins to remonstrate with them. And he says right there in the text, it is I who called you sons of the Most High. But look what you've done. You have not insisted on righteousness, caring for orphans and widows. He says to the gods, you will all die just as men die. In other words, I'm going to put an end to you and send you into the pit. But maybe there were 24 of them who never did fall. And so they remain in what we call the divine council or the the assembly of the gods. Now, if that language seems strange to you, we recommend the course we did here last term on... In any event, all of these divine beings seem to be creationists. They praise God who created all things and for whom they exist. So if you're a creationist, uh, don't feel bad. Don't feel lonely. All right, the second vision helps us to understand that everything revolves around a central figure. And that's Jesus, the Lamb of God. Then I saw, in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll, written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth, was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly, because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. The question is asked, who is worthy to take the scroll, break the seals, and begin revealing what God has laid out for the future? And of course, one is found who is worthy. Uh, we sang that song this morning, you are worthy. This is where that phrase comes from. All right, somebody read verse 6. And between the throne and the four living creatures, and among the elders, I saw a lamb, standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out to do all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, 
for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. So the seven spirits of God, they get sent out by the Lamb. Now, we understand that Jesus has redeemed human beings as a community from, from this text. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain! to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might for ever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. And so they sing about Jesus, crucified and risen, and he's receiving worship from all of the creatures in heaven. In other words, this Lamb of God is, shares in the divinity of the one seated on the throne. Now we come to chapter 6. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. And out came another horse, bright red, its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth, so that men should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand, and I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures, saying, A quart of weed for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth, to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. The four visions of war, famine, hunger, pestilence, these, these are the problems that follow war. Whether wars tend to destroy crops, this leads to famine. And then there's disease and pestilence, because those who don't have enough food, they get sick. Entire communities will often die out from disease before they die of hunger. Where there are not enough humans, the wild animal population in a region grows in numbers and in strength. They often begin attacking the human beings, who themselves are too weak to put up a defense. Let's think for a moment. If you were a first century Jewish reader, and we're assuming that the first writers and readers of the Revelation were Jewish Christians, and this idea of a sealed scroll was presented, what would be the first thing that you would think of from the Tanakh, from the Old Testament? There is a scroll, a sealed scroll in the Old Testament that is not opened yet. That's in the book of Daniel, where the Lord said, Daniel, write these things down, seal the scroll, and don't speak about it. And so here in the book of Revelation, a sealed scroll shows up again. Oh, and the Lord had said to Daniel, it's for the far future. And so what Revelation is saying, all right, the far future has now begun to be fulfilled. Think about this. If it's God who wrote the future, and the future happens to be disasters, wars, famines, and disease, and pestilence, 
and wild animals taking over. If God is so good, why would he decree such things for the future? Trying to get people's attention. That would certainly do it. Satan, Satan is control of the earth. Okay, well, Satan is, is ruling over the earth, but Satan rules over the earth through humans. Which humans happen to be ruling over all of the known world at the time that this book was written? Romans. The Roman Empire. You've heard the phrase, the Pax Romana, yeah. the peace of Rome. What was Rome offering to all of the nations if they would just submit to Roman rule? If you become Romans, you will have what? Peace. Peace. Protection. Protection. Prosperity. Prosperity. The rule of law. You will have roads and travel. And we will keep the wild animals under control. Whether you take that figuratively of enemy soldiers or literally of wildlife, these were the promises that the Roman Empire we're offering to the population. Sounds good, doesn't it? But at what cost? Your own freedom. Your freedom, especially your freedom to do what? To worship, worship whom you please. Say it loudly. To worship whom you please. Worship whom you please. Now the Romans did have what they called licit religions. Those are recognized religions that were legal, and all other religions were illicit. They were illegal. You were not allowed to follow those religions you could be prosecuted. Of course, when you prosecute someone for the religious practices, we use a little different word, persecute. Now, here was the problem then. Was faith in Jesus Christ as the living God a licit religion or an illicit religion? Illicit. Uh, well, that's what the synagogue, the, you had the traditional Jews and the Christian Jews, the traditional Jews, they went to the courts and said, these other Jews over here, they are not worshiping according to law. And where the legal structures would listen to that, they would prosecute the Christians. But this got more ticklish under certain of the emperors who either demanded or expected to be worshipped as human gods. And wherever the Christians would not worship the emperor, they could be severely punished even executed. And so one of the things that seems to be happening here is that the living God does not allow godless powers to, to seize and retain rule over the earth. He'll make sure that they fail. All right, what structure in the earth today is currently offering the same things? Prosperity, protect the environment, stop global warming, ensure the rule of law amongst all peoples and nations around the earth, providing for all human needs. And of course, one of those needs is depopulation. There is such a structure. I just wonder if, if you're familiar with it. Uh, that's a, one world order is the concept, but there's an actual organization. It's called the World Economic Council. That's close. World Economic Forum. Sounds innocent. A forum. Well, that's, isn't that just where you go talk about things? I'm not saying that they are the ruling structure, but they are seeking to be the ruling structure. And there are several national leaders who have admitted publicly they follow the instructions and the decrees of the World Economic Forum. Can you name any of them? No. Justin Trudeau, for example. And who are the leaders of the World Economic Forum? Do you know him by name? Klaus. Klaus. Klaus Schwab. And he has a philosopher that works with him who gives him his ideas, many of them, a teacher at Hebrew University, a practicing sodomite. You know his name? Yoval Noel Harari. Yeah, if you don't know that name, you will. All right. Coming back then, the four horsemen will not allow that to succeed. A fourth vision. While these troubles are happening in the earth, there is safety in heaven. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw, under the altar, the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, 
How long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Uh, those who suffer death because of their stand for Jesus Christ are now found up in the heavens, safely kept. They ask, how long, O Lord, until you wreak <coughs> vengeance on the nations? And the answer is, rest for 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no. Rest for a short while. Apparently up in heaven, 2,000 years doesn't take her. So, martyrs in heaven await the divine vengeance. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, and the great ones, and the generals, and the rich, and the powerful, and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Suddenly, this situation on earth, which uh, includes a lot of martyrdom, but it arrives at a point where the rich move into their underground redoubts. The mountains they've carved out for themselves and filled with food, tennis courts, swimming pools, uh, oxygen generating machinery, that you're a world leader, you've never believed the Bible, but you do know what the Christians are saying. It's hard to avoid it. That a time of the wrath of the Lamb of God is coming, and when you see the signs in the heavens and the skies that, oh, my word, it's happening. Jesus said, you will see the sign of the Son of Man, the sign being the Son of Man, coming in the clouds of heaven. You are to that point to start looking up because your final redemption is drawing near, or drawing nigh in Old English. But for the unbelievers, this is a time to... Get into your underground redoubts and activate your laser weapons that you have in your satellite belt around the Earth. Maybe you can zap this guy out of existence on his way down. And if he makes it down here, remember we also have depleted uranium shells that go, will penetrate anything. So when this Lamb of God shows up with his saints, we'll know what to do with them. But just for safety, we'll do this from underground. Am I painting a weird picture? But why would they see that and realize it's truth and repent? Uh, that is actually the message that will be preached, is repent and believe in the true God. I think so. Anyway, there will be signs in the sky. Earthlings will fear the coming day of divine wrath. And then in a sixth vision, we have... Through all of this mess, some faithful Israelites. Chapter 7 After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. 
12 tribes of Israel. Now, there is a, an American religion that, oh, by the way, one, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes adds up to how many? Under 44,000. We have an American religion that teaches that they are the 144,000. Uh, however, most are not Jewish, and they do not qualify as any member of any tribe of Israel that I'm familiar with. But the 12 tribes are listed there. However, there's one tribe that's missing. Did you notice which one that was? Is it Dan? It's Dan. And he's replaced now with something called the tribe of Joseph, whose two sons formerly had been half-tribes. But now one of the half-tribes is renamed Joseph and appears in the late list instead of Dan. What happened to Dan as a tribe? They left their territory, moved up to Bashan, which was a pagan region of idol worship. And so, because they forsook their divine territorial allotment, they have excluded themselves from inclusion in the, in the list of the tribes. Yeah. Yeah. The tribe of Joseph, does that take the place of Ephraim? Yeah, the one that's not, the, yeah. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, clothed in white robes? And from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more neither thirst any more, the sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat, for the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. But rather, in the book of Revelation, we have this description then of both Jewish Christians from all of the tribes, along with innumerable Gentiles who are brought into the heavenly realm where they too worship God. And they come from every ethnicity, and they too are singing. And the heavenly beings respond to their song. And they sing that, noting that God has brought these people out of the great tribulation. So a spirit being says to John, who are these dressed in white? This innumerable, John said, I don't know, who are they? The spirit being replies, these are those who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. They've come out of the great tribulation. Now, there is an American theology, for some reason, most bizarre, strange theologies come out of America. I think it's because we're such a creative people, and we live in freedom, and we can say and think and write and even preach anything we want. That's harder to do, let's say, in a European country, where there's a state church, and you can be uh, prosecuted for teaching otherwise, at least it used to be. We'll come back to the tribulation in a moment. And the Lamb is shepherding them. Now, when you and I sing, do you suppose the angels join with us singing in heaven? And the Thursday group, so one guy suggested, well, maybe when they sing, we sing too. There is another major religion in the world who, back in its founding, decreed 
that worshipers must not sing when they come together. And so there's no singing in the mosque because the Christians sang. So the Christians sang what? Praise to Jesus Christ. Worship God through Christ. Well, this new religion excludes Jesus Christ from worship. And so they say, we won't sing my chant. All right, there are some theories in the various theologies as to what is meant by the Great Tribulation. Here are some that I have encountered. First, in the Jewish community, there, this concept of Great Tribulation is well known. Back, from, back in the Second Temple period, they were already talking about it. And most of them, for most of them that I have seen, which aren't very many, and not as well read as I put on, the Great Tribulation started with the captivity of Judah, taken off to Babylon, and will not end until Messiah comes. That's the Great Tribulation. Well, that's not the only view. Narrow that down to uh, strictly the Second Temple period. This is when Israel was under the domination either of the Greek Empire or the Roman Empire. Actually, it's kind of one empire, but the leadership shifted from Athens to Rome. And that was sufficient. <laughs> that was sufficient. So some said that's the Great Tribulation. It's being under pagan empires. Now, Jesus himself did use the expression once, following that tribulation. What was he talking about? He talked about the tribulation. I take it, by the way, that the Gospel of Matthew is written, Jesus was talking about the tribulation that took place from about 64 AD through 70, destruction of the temple, and didn't end until the fall of Masada a couple of years later. That was actually about a seven year period by coincidence, but no point is made of that. And so he said, after that tribulation, then will appear the sign of the Son of, of, the Son of Man in, in the heavens. Now, some said, oh, well, that one must end on this week, and Jesus' return must be the very next week. Well, not necessarily. I think what Jesus was saying was, the last thing that happened to this generation that is alive today will be this period of intense tribulation. And then, from then on, the thing you'd be looking for is the my return in the heavens. The book of Revelation fills in the gap. All right, Christian ch Christian churches sometimes use the phrase of tribulation or great tribulation for whenever Rome was persecuting the Christians for not worshiping the emperor. Protestants, how Christians, however, narrow that down to the persecutions that they suffered under the Roman Catholic Church and the governments who obeyed the Roman Catholic Church. Catholics seldom uh, go out and persecute anybody. They give instructions to governments to do that, at least they used to. And then in the Protestant missionary period, up through the 20th century, we would talk about persecution or tribulation coming from pagan chiefs and pagan governments. And then the evangelical movement, again, North American, they decided that the Great Tribulation, oh, that's a special short time of persecution under Antichrist. And so there cannot be a persecution, uh, there cannot be a tribulation until Antichrist shows up. Well, when Antichrist will show up, will there be tribulation? Well, of course. Uh, Jesus said, pray that you might escape from the troubles that are coming on the earth. So you won't necessarily die under Antichrist, but you will, you will pray every day. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. They even came and confiscated my vegetable garden. And keep us from the evil one. And so the evangelicals say, well, this will happen either before or after the second coming of Jesus, or follow that. All right, what can we make of this phrase? Remember what my presupposition was 45 minutes ago? What is the context of the New Testament and the book of Revelation in particular? We are to interpret the New Testament and the book of Revelation primarily by its second temple context. What did these words mean to Jews and to Christians in the first century? The seven-year tribulation of evangelicalism was not 1,800 years after that. 
probably means something else. So I get out my software and I say, show me where does this phrase occur in the Bible, in the Septuagint, and in early Christian literature. And you come up with one text that seems to nail it. This is in the book of 1 Maccabees. That book is a part of what we call the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha was part of the Greek Bible that the New Testament writers quoted from. The New Testament writers quote from the standard 24 books of the Old Testament. They also quote from the Apocrypha, or they use the language of the Apocrypha. Neat examples of that. And so, 1 Maccabees chapter... Oh, by the way, the Protestant Bibles that were printed in Europe after the Reformation included the Apocrypha. Eventually, though, the Protestants decided to leave that aside and go only with those books that happened to exist in Hebrew. Apocrypha, most of the Apocrypha no longer existed in Hebrew. <coughs> so we took it out. We never believed that it was scripture, but it was part of the Bible. So someone could read aloud for us these two verses from 1 Maccabees 9. Are you afraid of it? <laughs> They made an inquiry in search for the friends of Judas and brought them to Bacchides, how do you pronounce that? Bacchides. Who took vengeance on them and made sport of them. So there was such great distress in Israel, such as had not been seen in the time a prophet had last appeared among them. Okay, here's where the phrase great tribulation comes from in the Greek Bible. It's from 1 Maccabees. And this was following, this was during the time in Israel was Greeks. They had their capital over in Syria. Alexander the Great had conquered most of the known world at the time. As he was dying at what, age, what, 32 or so, he called in his four main military generals and he divided the empire up between them. And one of those names was named Seleucid. So we talk about the Seleucid period of time, or the, even the Seleucid Empire, uh, which included the Holy Land, Israel. And so okay, and from time to time, the Seleucid leaders would decide that everyone under their dictatorship should adopt Greek language, Greek culture, Greek religion. Let's unify the country. The nation needs unity. And we will decide what you must believe in order to be a functioning member of our society. Well, because the Jews resisted that so much, they often found themselves being persecuted, prosecuted, or executed. And so, in the Second Temple period, the Great Tribulation began at this period of time. This is the second century BC. The phrase here in Greek, Thelipsis Megali, Thus, the Second Temple Jews believed that the tribulation had started in the 2nd century BCE, in fulfillment of the book of Daniel, which Jesus then appropriated to talk about a further persecution, prosperity, tribulation in the lifetime of those who were listening to him. Well, kind of to sum it up then, if this perspective is possibly valid, then the Great Tribulation stretches all the way from before the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, gospel period, on through the time of the first century churches who are warned and given promises in the book of Revelation, continues on through the present day while heaven is honoring Jesus, the Lamb of God, who allows all kinds of human and natural disasters, sealing both Israelites who serve the living God as well as a multitude of Gentiles coming out of all the nations into the heavens. And will lead right up then to the coming wrath of the Lamb, when godless leaders will hide in their underground redoubts. As somebody concluded on Thursday morning, oh, we're in the Great Tribulation. Yes. And we have been. Now, will there be any more tribulation just before Jesus arrives? Yes. And the book of Revelation tells us how long it will last. How long? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. Exactly. <laughs>